evening, UTC. How are we doing this evening? I'm back. Wait. I hear glasses, but I'm not kissing anybody. So good evening and welcome to the 75th Gala. Welcome to our sponsors, to our guests. Um, table sponsors this evening, thank you so much. It's a continued investment, I know, um, in the time you've put to us and, and the, uh, what, what we like, that conversation, that ability to sit down and have a meal together. And I think that's been the case for so many years with everybody in this room. I, I see a lot of people brought their wives, their significant others. I know mine's traveled with me over the years and had uh, some terrific meals in several other continents. It's been my privilege to travel on behalf of uh, this organization and visit our friends in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro and in Spain um, to attend those conferences over there. A lot of that work can't be done without sponsorship and without the support of your dues. So we appreciate that. And uh, I'd like to thank this evening uh, some of those sponsors. From the table sponsors, Keller and Heckman. You're going to hear some more about Keller and Heckman. I think you've heard that they were the root, the start of this organization in 1948. So that's actually a really nice piece to come back around to. Thank you. <laughs> the folks at Osmos. Uh, I see Ron Billadu over there. Osmos has continued to support us in so many ways. Ron was just elected the chair of the UTC Foundation. The other voice you heard is Mitchell Crocker, who was just elected the vice chair of the UTC Foundation. <laughs> Our friends at Power Trunk. We've had these conversations for a long time, too. I, I personally have never actually been able to use the technology, but every time I like to go by the booth and talk. We have a small rural utility over on the coast of Oregon where we still use flashlights to talk to our line crews. Wait, that was last month. Now I've got a new job. It's pretty cool. Anyway, Power Trunk, uh, stop by. It gives you a more global view of a lot of what's, what they're working on is a lot of what many of us, I think, would strive to. So thank you again for your support. PSI, Bob Haig. Many of you will know Bob and his people as the sponsors of the annual Cigars Under the Stars. It started years ago with uh, myself and Jeff, Jeff uh, I want it, Selman. I keep wanting to say Sheldon, but Jeff Selman. Having a couple of cigars out on the front porch in UTC's annual meetings. Again, that friendship, that bonding where you talk about some things that you have in common. That led to many other things. New people joining the crew. Some for their first cigar that was also their last, but others who are, you know, been longtime contributors to this. We actually had conference calls with Bob and his people to talk about what cigars they should be buying, where the best value is for the new smoker, the experienced smoker. We took this committee, if you will, of the board to a whole new level. But Bob, you've always been there and I appreciate it. And of course, our friends at West Monroe. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that West Monroe is at least the, the landing ground of one former chair but they have the, the, the vision, I think, to look across this, un, this industry and to look at um, what solutions fit and how those solutions, wait, wait, this sounds familiar, right? Everybody you talk to on the trade show floor today is doing exactly that. They wanna hear from you. They wanna hear how a solution fits into what you're doing. What do you need right now and what those boxes are and how you hook those together? West Monroe's been there for us in that capacity for a very, very long time, and thank you. As, as I said at the onset, the 75th anniversary, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight to help us celebrate this in a gala fashion. We had drinks. We're going to have a nice dinner. We have an after party afterwards that we talked about, but I was joking earlier with Peter that, I, you know, I've served this organization in many in many capacities. I may look like your waiter tonight, but I won't be serving you in that capacity. 
Each of us have actually uh, served in many capacities. You heard you speak earlier this morning about that call to service, answering that inner voice when somebody asks for help. We're asking for your help with UTC. We want to see more years. We want to see another 75 years of this collaboration between people with a common interest, and that interest is utility telecommunications. So enjoy your meal. Have a wonderful evening, and we look forward to uh, chatting with you a little bit later as Jeff Sheldon and I are going to run through some slides. You've seen some that will look familiar um, that are a little more recent, but Jeff and I will talk about those 75 years, how we got here, the battlefields that we fought, um, the technology-oriented issues that we dealt with, and uh, at the end of the day, why many of us are now and will continue to be friends. Thank you all. So welcome back. I hope everybody had an opportunity to enjoy dinner. It sounds like the conversation was as we're accustomed to. Hopefully new friends. Um, I didn't see our friends from Siena down on the end, and I appreciate that. Again, continued support. Um, thanks again for, uh, for sponsoring a table and for joining us this evening. And I also noted that while I was talking about sponsors, Kelly pointed out to me that Tri-State G&T bought a table. The entire crew, where are you? Thank you. As you know, the Tri-State company itself has been a longtime supporter of UTC, number of members on the board. Uh, there's at least two past chairs that I know of, the aforementioned Jeff Selman being one of them. But this evening, what we'd like to do is look back across these 75 years, as I said, how we got to where we are. So joining me here on stage. We're twins, practically, right? I mean, <laughs> there was going to be this Penn and Teller kind of thing, and then we decided, <laughs> no, we're not going to go there either. So Jeff has, um, Jeff has prepared some slides and a talk for you tonight that show some of those issues that we talked about. Now what's important is Jeff is the public policy side historically and I am the technical side in pretty much every discussion we've ever had. I think we worked together on a number of topics over the years, but I think the, one of the more memorable trips that we had was we were invited to Brazil by, by uh, Dimitri. And his folks, we were in Recife, Brazil. So for those of you who don't know the Brazilian continent, imagine South, or the Brazilian continent. That's it, we'll have, it's catchy. The, the South American continent, the farthest point east into the Atlantic is Recife. Um, we were there visiting, had gone to speak on telecommunications issues. This was 1997. Flew down. Beautiful city. It's a fishing village, I guess, is that uh, sampled the food, but we started this relationship over the years that we've worked back and forth over different things. And I think uh, tonight just kind of brings full circle of exactly what that was. A little while ago, you saw over here a number of people holding their hands out with a ring. Bill Maroney, the second of our CEOs, presidents and CEOs, at one point said, you know, you're chairman of the board. There, it's, it's, a, it's a group that is, has, has put forth an extraordinary effort to lead, lead this, but they were brought up through the ranks. They were elected by the members to represent the members. And while you're only that chair for a year, Dewey's smiling. <laughs> There's shock on Kurt's face. That ring was meant to be a commemoration. And what you saw was the past chairs that are here with you tonight taking the annual picture that we try and take as we present that ring to our newest chairman of the board, Kurt Mason. Region 9, sorry, we've got this Region 9, Region 10 thing going on. West Coast takeover, I keep hearing. But uh, Gary Von Drasic and uh, Tony Supa will have something to say about that as New Jersey and Florida have entered the chat. So let's get with it. Jeff Sheldon. All right. Thanks, Ron. Um, when Carnell called me 
maybe a couple months ago, and he said, we're going to have a big anniversary gala, and all the UTC folks are invited, and I thought, wow, okay. And I said, when is it? He said, June 7th. I said, wow, right, that's right. 43 years, because no, 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 it's 75. It's like 75. I said, no, Sharon and I have only been married 43 years. June 7 will be our 43rd anniversary. So, I mean, I don't know what this UTC in 75 years has to do with anything, but thank you for coming to our 43rd <laughs> wedding anniversary celebration. All right, have a good night, you thought, y'all. All right, so uh, talk about the history of UTC, and I got to run the slides here. So, um, give you a little bit of background on why I'm up here, at least I think so. Um, I got involved in telecommunications law at a very early age, I think I was seven, um, and mostly did broadcasting and cable television, traditional telecommunication stuff, the things that communications lawyers did back in that day. And the firm I was at, eh, wasn't feeling real comfortable there, and I said, I think it's time to make a change, and I found that this thing called UTC was looking for an in-house lawyer. I mean, what, what the heck is a UTC? And I read up about it, talked to some people, and they said it's about utilities and how they use telecom. I said, this is great. I can practice law for two hours each morning, and I can read the paper, get a hobby, do crosswords for the rest of the day. I had no idea, I had no idea. So it, that was very illuminating to me, how much utilities use telecom, how they depend upon it, and how you really have to work with the FCC and Congress on a continuing basis if you want to protect what you have, even just protecting what you have, let alone getting any more. So I was very impressed and brought you know, more people in to help with the, the legal and policy positions at UTC. Loved my experience there, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the people I knew back in that day. And worked for the association in-house until 2000, and then went on to some other things. But tried to stay in contact with utilities, with UTC, and I know I've worked with a number of your companies over the years. So I just want to tell you how much I appreciate coming here, the invitation, uh, wonderful. Uh, this is a better looking crowd than I think I've ever seen at a UTC <laughs> conference. Um, no offense if you were at another conference, you were the good looking people at the old conferences, but all of you here, best looking group ever. So you should give yourselves a round of applause. <sighs> all right. And we're supposed to move, there we go, there we go. So what we're gonna talk about, history of UTC, and some of the things we're gonna uh, go through are kind of the factors that led to the formation of UTC, some of the key issues and, and services that started with UTC and continue today in one form or another, um, how changes in technology and the marketplace brought about changes in the industry, brought about changes in UTC, and mostly we'll talk about the people involved in giving birth, nurturing, and causing this organization to grow into what it is today. All right, utility communications before UTC. Believe it or not, utilities were using communications before UTC was born. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Hard to believe, but they, they were. Uh, this is an early form of communications over power lines. Uh, this was an experiment. Um, unfortunately, it was not very successful. And it kind of harkens to today. Um, this was analog. You can tell it's analog because it's got wheels, right? Um, but it harkens to digital technologies because um, this system believe it or not, suffered from imbalance and loss of packets. So that's where it all started. But in reality, utilities were using communications over power lines. Carrier current, uh, one of the earliest technologies from uh, you know, the 1910s, 1920s. Um, so 
recognizing that communications were very important to how these things work. Radio, which carrier current, as I understand it, not an engineer, but I know a lot of engineers, um, radio-based technologies were used very early in utility, in utility operations. Um, in fact, if you think about it, this, and this all makes sense, radio is a form of electrical engineering. Where were electrical engineers found mostly? Utilities, utilities right. So a lot of utilities were nerds, geeks, before those words were even coined, and a lot of them were amateur radio operators. And I'm sure there's a lot of ham, amateur radio operators right in this crowd. But they would get amateur radio licenses um, to experiment with this fairly new radio technology. They would convince somebody in management to buy some radio gear that they could set up and, and hoist a mast somewhere. And what we found is that the, the companies would use the radio for a kind of dispatch during the day. The thing would go silent at night, but they found that, hey, we're transmitting. We're trying to get people to buy more electrical appliances, including radios. So they would broadcast. Um, and we've seen some, some history that some utilities even had their own company bands that would get on their radio station at night and perform for people. And back in the you know, 1920s, there wasn't much to do for entertainment. So uh, they would listen to the utilities radio system. And then a lot of those, those broadcast, quasi-broadcast stations would be turned over to you know, legitimate commercial broadcasters or given to universities for educational type programming but utilities were at the forefront of using radio and actually bringing radio to the masses. Um, formation of UTC, and it's all about radio. Radio was the driving force leading to the development of, of UTC. Whoops, let's go back. That's a very important slide, FCC. Um, so the earliest regulation of radio was by the Department of Commerce and also the Navy was involved in a little bit because Navy saw applications for using radio for, for ship communications, obviously. Department of Commerce regulated radio. Um, in fact, this is a little factoid that will win you no drinks at the bar, but you can try it. Um, Herbert Hoover, remember, president? He was Secretary of Commerce and he would actually sign a lot of the radio licenses that were issued back in the 1910 type era. But it was found that radio was too limiting. Commerce wasn't really, didn't really have good instructions and, and guidelines on how to deal with radio. There was a 1927 Federal Radio Commission, which again, didn't really have adequate tools to, to deal with it all. 1934, Federal Communications Commission as part of a, a big package of federal regulatory agencies coming about. FCC was given a very big mandate. Radio, telegraph, um, what else did they have in there? Broadcasting. So they were given, oh, telephone. Uh, they were given a very broad mandate to regulate all forms of interstate communications. 1943, which is nine years after they were organized, kind of right in the middle of World War II, where obviously communications are very important, the FCC opened an initiative um, to look at radio spectrum allocations and how could this radio technology be used for productive use in society, for public safety, for industry, for all manner. And they created uh, what they called a Radio Technical Commission um, where am I? Radio Technical Commission uh, that would look at spectrum allocations. And they created 13 different, um, 13 different committees and a planning board to try to decide how spectrum should be allocated. Panel 13, uh, Committee 4, so each panel had a mission and then they had certain operating or working groups, working committees under the panel. Panel 13, committee four, was given the task of looking at portable, mobile, and emergency services. So electric utilities were brought within that ambit. Uh, January of 1944, so shortly after the technical planning board was created in 43, January of 1944, Panel 13 Committee 4 met in Chicago 
And the chair uh, was a gentleman by the name of R.V. Dondonville. And if you recognize that name, Dondonville, uh, one of the major awards for UTC was named after R.V. Dondonville, the chairman of that committee. He's, created a, he's credited, I guess you'd say, as bringing utilities together to talk about spectrum issues. Committee four was then quickly expanded to include not only electric utilities, but also gas, water, and steam utilities. So the work of Committee 4, along with all of, I'm sorry, Panel 13, Committee 4, as well as all of the other panels, resulted in some proposals and then finally some spectrum allocations by the FCC in 1945, allocating discrete channels or groups of channels to different industries. So why is this important? I view, I view this as important for two, two reasons. One, the FCC recognized at that time, 1944, Electric, gas, water, and steam utilities had communications requirements, and they had unique communications requirements. They weren't like telephone companies. They're not like broadcasters. They have unique communications requirements. They should have their own spectrum. So that's important, FCC recognition. Secondly, it's important because the utilities recognized that this overall effort was important to their, I don't want to say survival, but it was important to their continuing business operations. They needed to be involved. They needed to stay in front of the FCC and make sure they either could get more or you know, preserve what they had. So in July of 1948, uh, the members of Committee 4, I guess they still hung out together. I don't know if they went out to the bar or whatever. In July of 1948, the members of Committee 4 decided they really should keep the band together and to create uh, an organization that would be a perpetual organization so that they can continue to monitor what the FCC is doing and how they could impact um, FCC policy making. They pulled it together and they called it the National Committee for Utilities Radio, NCUR. It says it all, right? It's national, it's a committee, it's about utilities, it's about using radio. National Committee for Utilities Radio. Name was later changed um, in 1968 to Utilities Telecommunications Council. Um, at one point, I think there may have been two or three other name variations, but at one point, people said, everybody knows this is UTC, let's call ourselves UTC, which sounded fine on, in, in discussion, but we turned out that UTC was also used by University of Tennessee Chattanooga. There's a major corporation called U United Technologies. So it became UTC, the Telecommunications Association. And I know those of you that have gone on meetings and at that time, you go and say, we're from UTC. It says, what does U UTC stand for? And you can't say nothing because you have no, nothing to say. So we say, yeah, it's Utilities Telecommunications Council. So anyways, it changed. I think it went back to uh, Utilities Telecommunications Council and now Utilities Technology Council. But when we look back, at the formation of what we now know as UTC. There are certain issues and member services that arose very early on that we can still see today in one form or another. So one of the first things was spectrum allocations. And this slide just merely illustrates the complexity of spectrum allocations. The slide, the picture on the left is how someone graphically depicted how spectrum was allocated in what is it, 1928. And then by 1959, the FCC is overlaying more and more radio services, finding more bands to operate with. Um, and then the most recent big chart that you, many of you probably have on your wall, maybe you don't, um, in 2016 shows all the different services and how they're squeezed in to what's considered the usable bandwidth. So spectrum has become, spectrum management has become very complex over the years. So it was important for UTC to try to stay on top of that. Frequency coordination. All right, so everybody gets some spectrum allocated. The utilities get some channels allocated to them. How can they be used without everybody causing interference to each other? Frequency coordination. One of the very first things that um, UTC did was provide a frequency coordination service. And I understand from folks that it did it. It was a lot of volunteers working at the regional level uh, with paper maps on the wall, push pins and string to measure distances, and, and three by five cards to keep track of 
who all was using what frequency where. And it's evolved to today where you have UTC spectrum services with a fairly sophisticated computer system to accept applications, process, and make recommendations on, on, uh, on how frequencies are used. But fundamentally, it's still frequency coordination as it was done or as it was needed to be done from the very early days. Then you look at legal regulatory. And up until 1955, it was handled by volunteers uh, trying to keep tabs on what the FCC in Washington, D.C. was doing and whether this organization ought to be talking to the FCC or commenting or getting the industry together. And by 1955, the leadership of UTC recognized it was too much for volunteers. They needed professional help. And there was a, a young communications lawyer in D.C. by the name of Joseph Keller. And he had, um, I guess, worked at the FCC for part of his career, but he was with a firm. And they invited him to come to the, at that point, the NCUR meeting and give a presentation on legal regulatory issues affecting utilities. And it started from there. Uh, Keller started his own firm, and I'm talking for you, you folks at the table. You probably know the Keller and Heckman history better than I do in this presentation, can say it in the presentation. But the Keller and Heckman firm then became, in essence, the general counsel to UTC, also provided strong administrative port support to the association. Um, and so, therefore, UTC became more of a force to be reckoned with when dealing with the FCC. Mike Meehan. How many of you recall or were with UTC while Mike was executive director? Still a number. Okay. I cannot understate the importance of Mike Meehan to this organization. Mike um, started out as an associate with Keller and Heckman, was assigned to the UTC account, and quickly became a, a rising star, if you will, in the eyes of, of everybody with UTC till he was basically managing the account. So for over 30 years, um, Keller and Heckman, and then led by Mike Meehan, provided the legal regulatory support and administrative support. Conferences like these, seminars, were all put on by the administrative staff at Keller and Heckman. 1988, uh, the membership uh, decided that there was such growing need for support for the association that they wanted to create their own independent organization outside the structure of the law firm itself. So Mike um, said that he would be willing to be the first executive director. So he was hired by the, the volunteer members of UTC or that they had organized. Hired Mike to be the executive director of UTC and Mike then set about to create his own staff and set up his own structure for running the association outside of the law firm. He brought over some of the administrative staff, some of the folks that had been working on conferences and, and frequency coordination and planning, and set up a new office. I was one of, Carnell wants to say I was the first, but I don't think I was. I think I was maybe higher number 10 uh, for the UTC staff. I was brought in to help out with the, the legal regulatory program. Um, Carnell and Joanne were there in the early days. Um, everybody knows Carnell. Yay, Carnell. Yeah. Best hire ever. Best hire ever that Mike made. And Joanne, I don't know if Joanne is in here too, but she was, yeah, where are you? There you are. Yep. So. So Mike pulled together his new team at the new UTC offices, and uh, we brought some more people in uh, to, to run the organization. Now, I have to give a little bit more background on Mike Meehan. Um, he's key to how this organization was set up and how it went to the next level so quickly after, after leaving his law firm. If you knew Mike, or you know, you knew Mike, um, sorry, he passed a number of years ago, um, a big part of his personality and management style can be attributed to his time in the Marines as a tank commander in the Korean conflict. Um, he would often bring out analogies of 
fighting and you know, marshaling resources. Uh, it was a very, very big part of his life. It was ingrained in him. So what I see, Mike brought to UTC strong legal regulatory knowledge. Um, he had a great love of the people and the industries involved in UTC. And he had a no-nonsense management style that I believe was from his time in the Marines. And all of those factors allowed Mike to build this organization, raise it to a new plateau, give it its independence, if you will, and create a, a, the future of where, kind of where we are today. And obviously, there's a lot more people involved between Mike and where we are today, but he was a major factor, so I, I do want to pay tribute to Mike and Ian. Um, among the early activities with UTC uh, that, you know, kind of related to legal regulatory is FCC liaison with a staff in Washington starting with a law firm, starting with its own independent staff. The association could make frequent visits to the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the FCC to talk with the actual policymakers and how their policies might impact utilities and likewise how utilities would like maybe some changes in those policies. We could also visit with the staff at the Wireless Bureau in Gettysburg who would actually, would actually implement those policies on licensing systems or, or adopting you know, little policies on how things are done. Um, so on the slide, there's a picture. I don't know if you've ever been to the Wireless Bureau in, in Gettysburg, but it's a nondescript building. You'd think it was maybe, oh, well, it's offices, but very nondescript. And as I understand, it used to be a shoe factory uh, that the government bought and turned into the FCC Gettysburg office. So when you say the government has no soul, <laughs> okay, sorry, I had, I, I had to do that. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, so the other thing that UTC did from an early age is just getting people together. Let's start with uh, Committee 4. It was getting utilities together that recognized they had a common concern, common issue with Spectrum. It's getting people together. It's networking. It's creating conferences. It's creating seminars. It's working with vendors to learn what they can do the vendors learning what they need from the utilities. All that started very early, and it continues today. It's one of the major uh, factors, uh, features of UTC. So as we've seen, UTC's carried forward through the decades with functions, services that started very early, and we're still doing them today. When you start with a strong foundation, you can get through any kind of change. And our world, our industry, has changed a lot since 1948. So I think about what are the catalysts for change that brought about changes in UTC. And I can break them down into basically two categories. Um, changes in technology and changes in the marketplace. So let's look first at changes in technology. We talked about land mobile radio, and mobile radio kind of quickly morphed into telemetry, which then morphed into SCADA, um, kind of same basic technologies. The other major technology leap, at least in my opinion, is point-to-point -point microwave. And like this is a cover of a magazine from 1950 heralding the, you know, the new era of microwave. And that was also a big game changer for utilities because you're no longer de totally dependent on telephone companies to get your communications over long distances. You could communicate to places where telephone companies didn't go or didn't want to go. So I, it, I, to me, microwave, um, again, lawyer, not an engineer, but microwave was a big, uh, big feature for utilities. And U UTC was there to try to promote the idea of using microwave from frequency coordination and licensing and, and policy assistance. And I know in our presentations, our presentations with the UTC, we would bring this out. The importance of microwave was even recognized by the Federal Power Commission before the FCC. Uh, after the Northeast blackout in 1965, the Federal Power Commission uh, created, a, I'll call it a task force, to look at what went wrong. What could, have, what could we have done or what could industry have done to prevent that major catastrophe? And one of the factors was 
they thought there was too much interdependence between telephone companies and electric utilities. If the phone company, phone system goes down, what are utilities doing to communicate to bring the power back up? If the power doesn't come back up, what are the telephone companies going to do to power all their switching offices? So the Federal Power Commission said, really ought to loosen up the uh, interdependencies between the two industries and microwave, they specifically mentioned point-to-point uh, -point microwave, the utilities really ought to consider putting in more private point-to-point -point microwave so it would enhance and harden communications for the utility itself. All right, so we, uh, fiber optics, next big technological leap. And um, again, in my opinion, I think uh, over um, OPGW, um, optical ground wire, putting the fiber in the ground wire on the tr transmission system was a perfect technology for utilities because you need the ground wire. You've got now right of way, you've got a safe protection for the fiber. And so it was only natural that somebody came up with the idea of OPGW or, or uh, self-supporting uh, fiber, but allows you to transmit a lot more data, a lot more securely. It also provides the possibility of actually getting into the communications business because telephone companies at that time, period of deregulation, were looking at ways to get fast in the market. You got right away, you got towers, you got fiber, partner with utility. But that also scared the telephone companies if utility had that capability and it scared regulators. And the classic instance of that was a state tried to prevent an electric utility from forming into a consortium with a group of other utilities to provide an interstate fiber loop in a multi-state area. And one of the states was going to, uh, threatening to prevent one of their utilities from getting involved in it. Utilities, UTC, got involved, and the upshot, after a lot of legal maneuvering, was the FCC preempting um, the state regulation saying, no, these utilities are fine. They're trying to help promote interstate communications. We are the exclusive regulator of interstate communications, so we don't want states interfering with that. That was huge. So that opened up the idea that utilities could get involved in communications. There was a window for them to get involved in, in interstate communications using fiber or microwave without fear of their state regulators coming down on them. Changes in the communications market. So we just went through technologies. Changes in the communications market. Um, the first big one I'd like to address is cable TV. Cable TV was going to be the competitor to the telephone companies, right? Everybody wanted better TV. They wanted more channels. Phone companies were just absolutely terrified of cable TV because they controlled the pipeline into, into the home. Cable TV came along. Government wanted to support it. Uh, wanted to get a foothold in the marketplace as easily as possible, and in their grand wisdom, adopted a thing called the Pole Attachment Act of 1978. Anybody here the Pole Attachment Act of 19? I know this table knows all about it. Um, a little personal aside, I was in college back when all these debates about cable TV and pole attachments, and I was hap I happened to be interning at the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, which was the regulator of cable T at that, that point. My boss was very involved in how, and how states could regulate pole attachments, et cetera. He brought me down to some congressional hearings about the Pole Attachment Act, and I just sat there and just shook my head, said, man, there's got to be something better to do in the world. This is not, you know, <laughs> how much space on a pole and who tried? I was like, i gotta find, I got to find a better career. <laughs> Where are we now, 2023? These issues are still kicking around. I had a hallway conversation. They're still kicking around. There's still complaints. There's still policy, the FCC. Anyways, that is the issue that will never die. Big issue, pole attachment. So that's all I want to say about that. The other big issue, competition and deregulation. Um, the other big change, if you recall, we used to have a unified one company kind of controlled most of the telecom market, right, AT&T? And then you had the modified final judgment in 1984 that theoretically broke up the telephone system. It didn't say they couldn't get back together, but it broke them up, all right? Um, and then shortly, somewhat shortly, uh, 1996, Congress adopted the Telecommunications Act, 
which further deregulated the industry, created more opportunities for competition. And so where UTC came out was kind of looking at the new opportunities. There's new, new providers in the market, new services. Let's look at how we take advantage. There's also new opportunities to get into the market. Not only, really, you know, so there's open competition. There's actually, you know, they were encouraging utilities to get in because regulators saw that utilities do actually touch every home and business in the country. Maybe they could be that third wire. So I view this as one of the other things that brought some change into UTC um, for the better, betterment of um, its members. We talked about land mobile radio, private land mobile radio, and how important that is to utilities. Well, then mobile radio came to the masses um, last century with the growth of commercial mobile radio. Beyond cellular, you know, the FCC opened up huge amounts of spectrum for personal communication services, and it's exploded beyond then. Consumer demand for, for commercial uh, mobile radio. So again, on the one hand, this created some opportunities for utilities. Maybe they could offload some of their private communications, non-critical administrative communications to carriers while keeping the critical communications on the private network. So it created opportunities. But it also brought about challenges because where did the government find the spectrum for PCS? Two gigahertz, which utilities were heavily, heavily invested in at the time. And you know, the FCC said, we'd like you to move off your two gigahertz frequencies, thousands of microwave paths around the country, you know, utilities, railroads, pipelines, public safety agencies, government agencies. We'd like you to move off so that we can bring PCS to the masses. Well, that didn't settle too well with a lot of people. And I would say that UTC was on the leading edge of the, the lobbying and, and regulatory campaign to get the FCC to recognize that you can't just have all of these industries overnight turn these things off and absorb the huge costs and disruption to their networks for something that other companies are gonna to make tons of money at. So it was, a, it was a very successful plan the FCC adopted to reimburse. Everybody had a microwave license at two gig, reimburse their relocation costs. I know a lot of companies took the opportunity as part of that plan to, to move from analog to digital, so it was a bit of an upgrade. No one liked to do it, but I think most people came out whole or maybe even a little bit better than where they were because of UTC. All right, PCS. The other thing that came out of PCS, Spectrum Auctions. I don't know if you remember these three guys. Um, the one on the right is the FCC chairman. He was a president, I think, and then a uh, vice president beside him. Anyways, PCS auctions, the, I think at that time, it may still be the case, that was the largest public auction of an asset in world history or known history, like close to $8 billion raised in one auction, um, selling the spectrum for PCS. Now that threw a shudder through the industry. It's like, oh my, oh my word, we're not gonna be able to get free spectrum from Gettysburg anymore. We're gonna have to go to auction and buy it. My management will never prove that. I mean, it was just panic. But we got through that, and the FCC had some policies about uh, buying and selling spectrum on the free market, leasing spectrum, and I know there are a number of companies in this room today that have gone through that. You've either gone to auction and bought some spectrum, you have negotiated deals with other companies that have spectrum, you have leased spectrum from other companies, leased spectrum to companies. It's become a fact of life. And again, I think you can credit UTC for kind of explaining those rules of the road and how you don't have to view auctions as some big, bad, terrible thing. It's, it's another opportunity. It's another, another thing you have to do to just change to live in this industry. Demand for mobile broadband. Again, blessing and a curse. I mean, more broadband is out there. The challenge was these companies want to provide a lot of broadband. They need a lot of infrastructure to get their micro cells or whatever it is they're going to do. Um, and UTC was there to help utilities on making creative options or opportunities for leasing assets or partnering with the companies that want to do broadband so that you, know, that you, can, uh, you can at least get some revenue out of what these other companies are doing. And while the FCC was uh, busy making all the spectrum available for commercial carriers. They're also looking at how can they 
require people that have spectrum today use it more efficiently. And that brought us to the land mobile narrowbanding proceeding where everybody was being asked to replace their current equipment with narrowband technology over a fairly short time period. UTC working with other associations and, um, and the FCC worked out a plan that, you know, again, nobody likes to do these things, but at the end of the day, it probably was a lot less painful than what we were looking at when the FCC first, first proposed it. License-free wireless devices. Um, that seems to be one of the more recent challenges that UTC has been working on. Uh, consumer, consumer interest and knowledge about wireless devices, Wi-Fi, ubiquitous. I mean, everybody knows Wi-Fi now. Uh, no one's scared of all the different wireless technologies that are being promoted in the marketplace. We accept it. And manufacturers are promoting it. The FCC is promoting it. And where are they looking to put it? and bands are already licensed. You saw the spectrum allocation charts, they're filled. So UTC has been working um, to ensure that when these unlicensed devices come into bands that are licensed and therefore theoretically protected, that they are in fact protected. Again, you can, you can thank your association for working on all those issues. An association is really nothing if it doesn't have good people. And from my early experience with UTC, continuing to this beautiful crowd right here, it's all good people. Um, you know, Sharon, my wife, her last job was working for a trade association. I mean, she saw a lot of what I did working with UTC. She got to see it very close up at the association she was working. We talk, you know, exchange what we, what we observed and learned in our, our tenure with associations. And it's the people. It's getting, it's being able to come to a meeting like this and talk to people that do the same job that you do, have the same questions, ask the same, you know, they're not stupid questions because, you know, Joe over here has the same question. We can try to find an answer. So it's about the people. Um, I am not going to try to name everybody that has been critical or important to the success of this association. We'd be here till the next 70, I guess the 100th anniversary trying to name everybody. But I'd like to catalog what I view are the people that deserve the credit. And first of all are the visionaries, like the folks from 1943 that agreed to be on Committee 4 and work with the FCC to come up with spectrum requirements for utilities. And then quickly moving from that to realizing this is not a one and done deal. We're going to have to keep at this. We need to create an association. We need a national committee for utilities radio that lives on and that we can use when we need it. So I call these the visionaries. Um, there you go. Oops, I'm back, 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 back. I'm, I'm looking here, and like, why is this thing not changing? And then here we go. All right, I gave away, I gave away the punchline, so forget, the, forget that. Leaders through the decades. Um, so, there we go. I just thought it, and it moved. Um, so, the other people, right, right behind the visionaries who created NCUR and UTC, were the people that realized this needs to be an association that's a big tent. Invites a lot of similar industries. Maybe, they're not, maybe they don't have the same ownership structure. Maybe they're investor owned. Maybe they're municipally owned. Maybe they're a cooperative. Uh, maybe it's a water utility, an electric utility. But we're able to get a lot of different industries and different ownership structures into that big tent and work through issues of common interest. And UTC, I view, has been able to do that very successfully. Even if maybe certain companies or certain industries have a different opinion on a particular issue, UTC's been able to find consensus, find and build consensus to advance the issue uniformly. And I think that's rare in associations. I mean, if you look at some of the other associations where these companies start off as competitors from the get-go, um, they are in the same market, they're competing for the same, exact same customers for the same services. Think how difficult that is when they get together to talk about strategic issues. 
UTC, I think, is fairly unique in how everybody's able to gather in this big tent and everybody's able to advance their interests. Um, let's go back again here. Um, people. Um, I would bring in specific names. I would bring in Joe Keller, Mike Meehan, and their colleagues at, at Keller and Heckman for providing a solid foundation for the association, uh, giving it the DNA, if you will, in other words, giving, giving a, a mission for UTC. I acknowledge the volunteer leadership, um, uh, and specifically in 1988, who had what I'll call the courage to break away and to set up their own organization structure, taking a chance on Mike Meehan to set that up and continue all the work that had been done in the decades prior to that. The regional officers, the committee chairs, the committee members, a lot of the work that was done in Washington came up through the volunteers at the regional organizations. We had a number of issues where we actually more or less tasked regions with helping us come up with solutions to problems the FCC was throwing at us, and we were able to get the ideas to percolate up. The lawyers were able to translate it into the legal regulatory jargon that the FCC wanted to hear, and we could advance the issues. The international leaders who kind of took, what I'll say, they took the, the UTC's DNA and propagated it internationally to realize that you know, the issues we're having in the US, in Latin America, in Europe, Canada, Africa, they're all common. I mean, regulators might be different, policies might be somewhat different, but fundamentally the services, the facilities that are being used, they're the same. So I, I, I commend the international leaders for taking that DNA and, and helping to spread it through the world. The UTC executive directors um, slash presidents, CEOs that have guided this organization in Washington, they deserve a lot of credit for what's going on or has gone on. And finally, um, and the staff. I don't want to I acknowledge some of the staff. Um, let me ask you, how many, who here is or has been on the UTC staff? Yes, thank you. Um, so anyways, UTC uh, executive leadership and staff. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge the management of your companies and the manager, management of the companies that have been involved in UTC that had the foresight to support this organization, either with funding or allowing you and other volunteers to come and support the work of the association. Uh, they didn't have to do that, but they saw value in it. Okay, so that was a quick recap of UTC's 75 years. So what does the future hold? It depends on you. You are UTC. The, the slide originally was cute. It said, you are UTC. But I thought, nah, this is, this is not a texting crowd. It's a, you, you are UTC. Um, so that depends on you. You are the future of UTC. Everyone at this conference is continuing the work of thousands of volunteers that came before you for this organization since 1948. Uh, the technologies change. The marketplace changes, but UTC is resilient and has been built to tackle those challenges. So I firmly believe that with your continuing support and those that come after you, the future looks very good for UTC. Thank you. Um, and I think UTC is going to meet every challenge in the future, except that one. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Okay, we've still got a couple more hours. Q&A. No. <laughs> we have the bar out on the intercoastal. We're going to get out there very soon. And I'm going to ask our immediate past chair, Dewey Day, to come up and take us, uh, take us in that direction. I guess this is his first official duty as the immediate past chair. He gets a year. It's, we, we try and keep people around for just a little while. Uh, like we said, it's not the wisdom, it's the experience. Thank you, sir. You, you see what's really funny is 
the script, he wasn't supposed to call me the immediate past chair. He was supposed to call me the chairman. So I had a whole great joke lined up, but it's too great for me to not use it. So I'm just going to stick with it and say that at 1.53 and 28 seconds today, I became the immediate past chair, and I'm no longer the chairman. And you can tell by the immediate past chair grin. <laughs> Uh, we just coined that at the table here earlier with the group of immediate past chairs. Um, so Ron and Jeff really helped us see the, the, the history of UTC and the challenges coming up in the future. Um, and it's thanks to the work of the men and the women in this room that got involved to made UTC what it is. In this room, we need to find the next Keller. We need to find the next Meehan. We need to find the next Dursak to continue this mission forward. It's very easy for us to take the 75 year history of this organization for granted and we absolutely cannot do that. And that's the message I wanna leave you with today. Get involved at whatever level you can. We all have to play a role in building UTC's future right now and we all get out of UTC exactly what we put into it. So I don't wanna waste any more time. As the man said, the bar is now The bar open. is open. <laughs> This is, this is the last, from my humidor, of the UTC Telecom 2007 labeled cigars. And Carnell knows I'm a pack rat. We go back and forth. We text back and forth of, hey, I've got one of these. Oh, I got one of these. Back and forth to, he finally one ups me one night with, I got a time card signed by Mike Meehan. I'm like, all right, I win. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to the bar. Thank you so much. <laughs>